Yeah, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Sven Oehmer. Uh, I'm part of the IBM Spectrum Scale research team. Uh, so Spectrum Scale is the new name for GPFS, who hasn't caught up on that news. Um, so I'm working in the performance group, and I was asked to talk very specifically about some of the changes that we're going to do uh, for a project which is tracked under the name CORAL. So CORAL was a very large government lab RFP, and some of the subset of the requirements that basically came along with this project, uh, I wanted to share some of the data with you. <clears throat> so I had to put a disclaimer in, so none of these performance data can ever be used for sales. So obviously you can't use this information in RFPs, um, because obviously some of those require very special tuning um, in order to get these results. Okay, so I'm going to talk about basically three topics. Uh, so we got a large number of requests, and I'm going to share with you what kind of high-level requirements we got for the core contract. Uh, but basically, they did lead into a lot of different development items. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about uh, is some automatic tuning capabilities of Spectrum Scale. Uh, the second one I'm going to talk about is a communications overhaul. So in order to achieve some of these very uh, complicated requirements we got, uh, the existing communication code was just not good enough to handle that millions of transactions uh, required to do that. Uh, and then I'm going to provide some updates on uh, shared versus non-shared uh, directory create and metadata performance rates because that's always a, a very hot topic, first of all. And second of all, we have to make very, very strong commitments in the Coral RFP what we're going to deliver next year when these systems are going to get shipped. So let's start with uh, optimizations in basically spectrum scale uh, general performance optimizations. So one of the challenges uh, we have uh, with spectrum scale, and that is obviously not different with Lustre and many other distributed file systems, is there are gazillions of different workloads and gazillions of different requirements customers have. Uh, so no workload is the same. Uh, every customer we go into typically has a very different type of workload. And so over the years, we accumulated a large number of essentially tunable knobs inside Spectrum Scale to optimize for very specific workloads, very specific use cases. Um, so given that the product is around now for around 20 years, um, the amount of knobs has accumulated to a very large number. So we have around 700 tuning knobs today in GPFS to basically deal with very special circumstances of workload. So most customers never see, never touch any of those. They are not really required for the majority of the customers. But what turned out is that over the time, we added more and more of these knobs. While some of these knobs should have not been there in the first place, they were basically being implemented first as a workaround. And then later, more and more customers basically run into the same problem. And so that these informations basically got shared and shared and shared. And now when you look at a lot of systems in the field, some of them have easily 30, 40, 50 of these parameters applied on the system. And one of the biggest problems with that is that some customers don't even know that actually they might hurt performance more than they actually help. And so I started a project uh, in the team about two years ago trying to figure out, okay, which of these things can we actually get rid of? So why do we actually have still 700 of them? Is there any way to eliminate some of them and even better make them so automatic that essentially the system detects heuristically, which of these special workarounds should be applied and then turn it on, and if they're not required, essentially turn it off. So what we essentially did is uh, we did a first uh, step on that, in which got released in 4.2.1. This is the release that came out earlier this year. There was actually a, an earlier version that had a, sub that, a subset of these uh, changes implemented in 4.2.3, which came out uh, around March of this year. So in, we basically introduced one new knob, uh, but the main difference between this one new knob we added is it eliminates over 30 of the other knobs that are already existing. So when you basically turn this new knob on, uh, beside the knob setting some very specific setting on the system, it under the covers turns on an auto-tuning capability, which essentially looks exactly at the node where you currently have running, so at runtime of the daemon. It essentially looks at things like how many CPUs does the machine have, how much memory is there. So it looks essentially on the environment, on where that, applica uh, where that daemon is running on, and then it adjusts all kind of internal parameters in spectrum scale, trying to provide the maximum performance of the client. And in order to validate that, we essentially took some very highly tuned systems, run some benchmarks like industry benchmarks like spec SFS and multiple other type of workloads. And um, so we basically validated that if you have a very highly tuned system, you now take all these knobs back, you turn them all back to default, 
and you just turn the auto tuning capabilities on, the, to the goal was to basically stay within 90% of the original achieved performance numbers. And so essentially with everything we validated, we could show that we at least got 90, most of the time almost close to 100% of the performance that you only got before when you basically figured out exactly what the performance configuration tuning option should have been in the first place. So therefore we believe this is going to be a significant um, enhancement for end users. It also takes a lot of the problems away that people have in the field tuning spectrum scale to run at the maximum performance. And so we're going to invest significantly more efforts in that to make this significantly easier. So this was also driven by the core project because over there we have a lot of very different hardware types. So the configurations of the nodes is going to be very different. There's going to be nodes with a lot of memory, nodes with very little memory, but huge number of cores. And so we wanted to make sure that we have something that doesn't need to be manually tweaked, but rather just works out of the box. And that's basically the result of, of, of that work. So the second thing uh, that we did um, over the last uh, 12, 18 months essentially, which also is got into code in 421, which was middle of this year, um, was a complete communication uh, overhaul. So spectrum scale, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of people here in the room who are using that today and, and probably know uh, that it provides an extremely high degree of performance already. Uh, but one of the things uh, that is driving changes in this area is the upcoming new technologies in, that, that you're seeing. So we have more and more customers demanding uh, 100 gigabit InfiniBand, 100 gigabit Ethernet. Some of the contracts that we already have to basically work with customers that are like one, two years out from now already demanding uh, bits with 200 gigabit InfiniBand, so stuff that doesn't even exist yet, or I think it just got announced this week from, from Milanox. So, um, NVMe on the storage side is another very high driving uh, demand for change uh, because with modern NVMe devices, the latency of the storage becomes so low that basically the communication overhead is the main driving performance scaler in, in, in the end-to-end. -end. If you look from the application onto your client node over the network to the storage system, if you use just spinning drives, Spinning drives have so high latency that RDMA networks and so on don't really matter that much. But if you start using things like NVMe devices where your latency of the device itself is basically in the two-digit uh, microsecond range, you just can't use uh, normal communication code anymore that, we've, that we basically shipped so far. And we had to basically reinvent a lot of the communication paths. And so what we did is we implemented an almost lock-free communication pass. So there's essentially no mutexes or anything in the code pass anymore. Um, only the error cases are protected in, in various states. But essentially, the, the short, we shortened the code pass dramatically. And that lead to significant performance improvements on the overall communication pass. And I have a couple of uh, charts um, demonstrating that. So first sharing some of these requirements. So these are not requirements that just came out of the core RFP itself, but there were outcomes on the later negotiations with the individual labs. But this is kind of the high-level requirements uh, that we got in, in order to deliver as part of that, uh, as part of that larger RFP. Um, so the customer uh, asked for two and a half terabytes per second uh, single stream IOR performance. So that means basically multiple nodes all writing into the same file at the same time. Uh, we have to deliver a very similar um, benchmark, which is only a terabyte per second, which is significantly less. But the challenge is the I.O. size is going to be one megabyte. Um, so you either have significant amounts of read modify writes going on, because even if it's state sequentially, for everybody who is more knowledgeable with distributed file system, there is nothing as sequential. So if you have a large number of stored systems, even if your client performs sequential I.O., at some point in time it ends up being essentially 100% random on the disk, even if it's large I.O.s on the disk, but it's essentially random. And so doing this with a very small block size is, is actually a, a significant higher challenge than just providing a significant large throughput. Um, a single node needs to be able to uh, read and write at 16 gigabytes per second into a single file. Um, it's another challenging requirement we got. Um, so if it would be multiple files, that wouldn't be really a very big deal for us today. But doing this into a single file uh, from a single node is, is, is quite challenging. Um, and the last, this is actually the hardest of all, uh, doing 2.6 million uh, file crates a second. Um, if that would only be zero length file crates, that might not be so bad to achieve. Uh, but it's actually 32K file crates. 
Um, and we need to sustain that over a time of, I think, something like 40 minutes, something like that, so you can do the math. Um, so you can't really cache this anywhere in a controller. All of these IOs really need to go to the disk, so there's basically absolutely no way to cheat. Um, so we really need to be able to drive sustained rates of 2.6 million 32K file crates, so that includes the metadata operations as well as the destaging of all the data blocks um, measured with MD test uh, across a larger subset of nodes uh, of the to be deployed cluster. So what do we have to do to basically get there? So let's go back to the communication pass um, uh, again for a little bit. So um, this is a setup that I was using for doing some performance tests. So this is not like, you know, high-end state-of-the-art machines, and we intentionally did that. We wanted to use basically hardware that we have already in the lab where we have a lot of data points on so we can basically look back in history and also figure out what these changes really drive in, in, in terms of changes on existing hardware. So we used uh, a couple of Intel nodes. So these are 12 uh, M4 servers. Uh, there is a Mellanox switch, and then there is a storage subsystem in, on the right that we used for the performance testing. And then uh, basically the very first test you're going to see um, is test with a new communication code. So what this test did was it essentially sends uh, between two nodes in the cluster one, ki one kilobyte large RPC requests. So there's basically a server and there's a client, and the client submits one K RPC request to the server, and then we basically get the response back and we drive the number of threads up for this test. So we start with one thread, go three, four, five, six, six, up, up to 30, 32 threads in total. And what you see on the very bottom, this is uh, the scaling factor that we had with the old communication code prior 421. So we were able to do something like 120,000 operations per second uh, between a pair of nodes. So you see multiple different iterations. So you basically see the months of the Git checkout that I used for, for doing the comparisons. And the top line is what we eventually shipped with uh, 421. And so, as I said before, this is always the same hardware. So the only change really was one single change, which was the GPFS communication code itself. We never changed a driver or firmware or anything in the past. It's really just only measuring exclusively the performance enhancements of the communication pass. And so if you basically compare from here to here, it's roughly a factor five performance improvement compared to the original code that we did the baseline measurement on. There's further enhancements in this area. So we have a target for next year to achieve a million. So this is basically between two nodes. Um, as soon as you start measuring multiple nodes to multiple nodes, the number even goes up because this measurement here exercises one extreme case where you only have two nodes talking to each other. So there's very specific data structures in the way that prevent us from you know, scaling to whatever the communication hardware is capable of doing. But doing a factor five improvement and then adding another factor five, uh, two improvement uh, by next year, we believe is, is a pretty reasonable enhancement. And it's putting us on the path of what we actually need to get in order to meet some of these other requirements. So as a side effect of that, uh, various workloads um, significantly improved. Um, so this is a single client throughput test. So this was one of the requirements that I've listed uh, earlier on the, on the page. Uh, so what you see here is um, TSQS perf is a built-in GPFS performance tool. It's similar to FIO. It doesn't do anything special, so it doesn't use any you know, special code inside GPFS. It's just a performance tool that we wrote and we ship with GPFS to make it more convenient to customers. On the other hand, we also know uh, exactly what the code does, so it's easier for us to debug if, if customers experience a problem and can easily recreate with this tool. And so all this tool basically does with the command is it writes sequentially um, a total of 200 gigabytes uh, in 16 megabyte chunks, so one at a time. It uses a total of 16 threads. So it's one process with 16 threads, um, and that's the pass to the file. And at the end, you see there is an F-sync flag at the end, which means don't return uh, until all the blocks are actually really destaged uh, to the disk drives. So they're all on hardened storage or, or not in, in any you know, um, memory tier or cache tier at, at some point in time. And so as you see, the, the test runs for a while, and then it comes back. And uh, the data rate for that single uh, operation uh, was essentially 16 gigabytes per second. So given that the machine had uh, only, I think, 32 or 64 gigabyte of memory, um, also the storage system used on the other side doesn't have any write cache for large IOs. It passes all the IOs through to the disks. So that shows that um, this is really something we can sustain. 
So even if I would have made the number bigger, it wouldn't really have changed anything because there is essentially uh, zero cache effects um, in, in that request. If I would have used direct O, uh, the number would have been even slightly higher. But given that this is not part of the RFP, we have to do buffered I.O. So that's why I measured with buffered I.O. And it just shows um, the, the capabilities of the new communication code. If you compare that same, same test uh, to the previous code, so on the uh, uh, prior 421 code, we were getting around, uh, depending on the hardware, it's really hardware dependent, also what kind of, uh, uh, what network you're using and how powerful the node is. But we got measurements from the field somewhere between three and six gigabytes per second. So it's almost a factor three improvement from basically the previous code base. And at the same time, by the way, the CPU utilization went down. So even we have a factor three improvement on performance, the CPU utilization on the system actually even went down with the, the overhaul of the code because we're not using mutex anymore, which burned a lot of uh, CPU cycles. Um, this got slightly misformatted, I think, when they put it into the presentation. Um, so the other extreme, um, you know, bandwidth is one requirement. On the other hand, the other extreme is latency. And latency is significantly more challenging than bandwidth because latency actually requires significant changes on code paths uh, because you can't work your way around by just paralyzing things. You actually have to shorten code paths and you have to take all the bottlenecks out of the way in, in order to get that down. And so what this test does uh, is basically the opposite of the previous one. So in, instead of trying to figure out how much bandwidth do I get between two nodes, um, what is the lowest latency for an actually end-to-end -end data transaction uh, a client can achieve? And so what this test, test does is it reads sequentially uh, one kilobyte at a time with direct I.O. and a single thread. So that's pretty much the worst case scenario one can imagine for an application. Um, yeah, you could read only a sector, but yeah, it's, it's a kilobyte in size, so it's, it's really tiny. And so what you can see here, as I said, it's slightly reformatted, so it would be the sixth column from the left. Uh, you basically see timestamps on how long it took uh, for the I.O. to finish. Um, and for the people who can't read it, it's between 50 and 80 microseconds per request. So this includes the whole round trip time. So this is really the application issues the I.O. on the application client node. The data has to go over the network to the server. Server has to read it from whatever media is behind it. This is a very fast system. Uh, so the media speed is, is really uh, completely ignorable at that point. And then uh, transferring the data back to the client, and the client has to copy the data into the application buffer. So the whole round trip time is, is basically what, what has been measured. And these are basically uh, the results of that. OK. so. This all leads us uh, basically into the last set of slides talking about the file crates. So I mentioned that a lot of these requirements um, are very challenging, um, but the last one is, is, is really extremely challenging because not just that the amount of metadata operations that need to be done in order to achieve 2.6 million IOs or 2.6 million crate IOs a second, um, we also have the problem that the files themselves actually contain data which means you have to flush additional buffers, you have to actually allocate data blocks while you're creating the files. So that adds a significant amount of, in GBFS terms, to token and allocation traffic in the system, because obviously every node needs to allocate blocks and they all need to synchronize with each other. So that adds a, a huge amount of burden on, on the network. And that was one of the key requirements why we had to change the communication code. So only if a node is capable of handling a large number of RPCs, uh, because some of these nodes will be meta node, uh, metadata managers, which basically will become meta nodes for individual directories and have to coordinate traffic for them. So that was a prerequisite to actually even even trying to get there. That got really mis. Uh, right. Okay. I think I should have used my laptop. Um, so that's going to be hard to read even for me from here. So let me try if I can get that right. Um, so in the four one, so basically what I did is I, I collected data and I can send an updated version later so they can upload. I mean, on my system it looked perfectly fine formatted. I'm not sure why it got misformatted here. Um, basically what you see on this chart is uh, basically two different data sets. So I did a baseline with an older version um, of uh, GBFS, uh, which was 411. So this is code from sometimes last year. Um, and I did uh, the first MD test. So what the MD test in all these different runs does, actually at the very bottom you see the, the command line that was used for that. Um, it, it is basically 11 nodes. So it's a very small number of nodes. Um, 11 nodes. Uh, each node should start only one task, if I remember correctly. I can't read it, but I think it's only one task. Um, 
And basically, um, each node is, uh, in this particular case, going into one and the same directory, so it's a shared directory case, and then every node with a single thread is just trying to create uh, files in that directory. And so with the 411 code, uh, we got uh, somewhere around um, 11 to 12,000 uh, crates per second. So as I said, this was with the code uh, as of last year. So we made some enhancements already in 4.2, uh, which I think, think shipped also still last year, but it was around December timeframe, so it was really end of last year. And uh, we made already the first step of, of enhancements in, in this code. Uh, and the number got slightly up. I can't really read it, but I think it should be somewhere around 23 or 24,000 crates per second. So we got almost a factor two improvement on crates. Uh, if you look at stats and removes, uh, the numbers were even higher. I think the biggest uh, improvement we have on, on removes, uh, we got like a factor six or seven improvement on, uh, on remove rates in the shared directory due to some enhancements in the common uh, shared lock directory code, uh, FGDL code, which we call it in, in GPFS. So we did not stop there, and unfortunately also that one is misformatted. Um, so we made further enhancements, particularly for the uh, Coral project, and um, so this is uh, now code that has not shipped yet, uh, but it's gonna uh, shipping pretty soon in, in a couple of weeks, uh, which is uh, the new code that has some of these uh, pre-enhancements uh, for the coral delivery in it. And that allows us uh, to basically, in a shared directory, uh, right now create somewhere around 42,000 crates per second. Uh, the number of removes, I think, is somewhere in the 200,000s, if I remember correctly. Um, no, actually, it's 122,000 with this code step. So there is a couple of additional enhancements we're going to do because the target is to achieve 50,000 um, file uh, crates and deletes per second in a single shared directory from a larger number of nodes, and so with the next drop that is already essentially code uh, decode, uh, decode complete, but just has not went through QA and, and shipping, we are basically within 20% uh, of the target. And so the next enhancements that we're already working on that's going into the next release, which comes immediately after that, which is long ahead of time for the call delivery, uh, we know for sure that we basically gonna exceed uh, the 50,000 uh, crates per second in the shared directory case. So basically over the course of about one and a half years, uh, we were able to improve the performance almost by a factor five on crates, uh, and it improved by over, I think, a factor 12 on, on the leads. Um, and so all these other, uh, um, the other various MD test uh, um, uh, operations also significantly improved. Unfortunately, we can't read it because of the, the misformatting. Okay, but as I said, um, the shared directory case is just one, and we were quite confident uh, before already that we can easily achieve that. Um, it just you know, required some significant amount of work to get done, but kind of the concepts and the design and everything was clear. Um, the much harder case is the second one, and this chart actually doesn't represent that particular workload. Uh, I have another couple of sets of charts uh, that I could not get uh, into the presentation in time. I can send Stephanie an updated version that has that additional chart in it. Um, so this chart basically just shows uh, a crate test um, across multiple nodes that do uh, crates in their own directories now. So instead of having one shared directory, they basically all create in their own directory. It's the same 11 nodes that are doing the crate rates. And um, as you can see, we're doing 352,000 uh, crates per second um, in this particular test, um, and 374,000 uh, deletes per second. Um, so that's almost, or it's a little bit more than 30,000 crates and 30,000 deletes per individual client node uh, involved in the test. And we know that it scales with a large number of clients. So if you need to do more, it's basically just a question how many nodes are gonna get involved um, in that particular workload. And that is the end of the presentation. But I'm more than happy to take a couple of more questions. Questions? Thank you so much, Ben.